Well, welcome. Uh, thanks for, uh, for being here today. And uh, I've, I've spoken on uh, net zero energy homes for several years now. It's uh, kind of feeling like you know, we just ought to be doing this. I mean, it, I, we shouldn't need anybody speaking about it anymore because it should just be what we do. Uh, I got my Tesla on uh, Saturday. And uh, if you're not driving an electric vehicle, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's where we're going in the future, and, and really the future is now. Uh, I, I realize there's still a little on the spendy side. It's more than I've ever spent on a car, but I kind of feel the same way about, uh, about net zero energy homes, net zero energy buildings. It's just, we can do it. We have the technology. It's not that hard. It doesn't cost that much more. In fact, sometimes you can do it without it costing any more. And uh, so I'm just gonna step through uh, some of the things that we do really in our, our normal everyday design for each, uh, each house uh, that, we, that we are designing these days. Uh, this conversation happens with every one of our clients and so I'm just going to share kind of what we do and what we have done. Uh, I also uh, was fortunate enough to be a speaker for the Sunshot Initiative, it's the Department of Energy. Uh, they they were they are looking for ways to um, advance photovoltaics, and so I was one of I think six six speakers that flew around the country presenting a one day seminar. And I've thrown some of those slides into here. That wasn't uh, necessarily geared towards residential. That was more commercial, but some great information about photovoltaics. So, uh, including this this was one of the slides. So. We know that our buildings use 40% of the primary energy in the United States, and we use 70% of the electricity. So that is a, a huge amount, and that's, that's, why, that's why I do what I do, uh, because I want to reduce, uh, reduce the amount of energy that we use, and we can make a huge difference uh, in our environment, in our energy use in the United States by concentrating on, on buildings. I'm glad other people are concentrating on things like automobiles and, and how we generate that electricity and all of that. That's all very important. As an architect, I can make a difference in the buildings and as uh, the general public who lives in buildings and uses buildings, uh, we can all make a difference through our energy use in the buildings especially if you are embarking on a design project, a construction project, uh, paying attention to these things is, is uh, very, very important. So, uh, What we're gonna talk about today is, uh, we'll start off with a definition of what net zero energy is, and then we're gonna go through four, uh, four critical steps that you need to go through in order to create a net zero energy home, and it's really not any different it, it's also applicable to commercial buildings. It's really the same, the same thing. And then we'll close out with some photo, uh, photo, uh, photovoltaic information, and I'll show you a few more projects that, that we've done at the end. So definition of net zero energy. Uh, there we go. Uh, I like the, the developer's definition. I get this all the time. They think they've created a net zero energy building because they put some photovoltaic panels on the top of the house and they know that will offset all of the electric usage in the building, in the house. And it's like, well, you got part way there. Yeah, pat them on the back, it's a good thing. But uh, unless you've got a fully electric house and you're doing all of your, uh, especially heating in our environment with electricity, you're not gonna get to net zero energy. Uh, so we've got, to, uh, we've got to get rid of that natural gas usage and then, uh, and then offset all of the electric, electric usage in the entire house or building. Then we're at net zero energy. Uh, so California, I, I don't know, I just got to pick on them a little bit. They came out with this great statement that all homes by the year 2020 have to be net zero energy. And I was, I was excited. I thought, hey, that's great. Way to go, California. And then I delved into what they mean by net zero energy. And they kind of just, they kind of squirreled it around a little bit. And they, they made it so that when you generate energy at the peak time of day, when the grid needs the energy the most, they give you a huge boost for that. So they count the energy more. And then when you, when you draw the energy back off the grid uh, late at night, you're, you're, uh, drawing at a, at a lower rate. So uh, it's not true net zero energy. Uh, I think it's good that, they, that they're 
taking a stance like that, but I wish they wouldn't call it net zero energy because it's really not. It's close. They're getting closer, and, and, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, this, uh, the definition that NREL actually uses is uh, based on source energy. Now that means that they're going back to uh, how the energy is created. They're, uh, they're, they're looking at, uh, at the, the power plant where the electric, uh, electricity is generated. And what that does with source energy is if you are using, uh, say, natural gas in, to heat your home, uh, the NREL's definition of net zero energy allows you to offset that natural gas usage with electric generation. So you generate more electricity than you need and put it back into the grid, but then you're using natural gas. I really don't like that definition. Uh, I realize it's, you know, it, it's you know, maybe necessary in some instances, but I would rather uh, push our, our designs to using only electricity, and then we generate all that electricity that we need annually on site. So that's my definition is much simpler. It's just generate the energy that you need on site, use it on site, use the grid as your you know, battery per se. Uh, so when you generate more energy than you need, you put it into the grid. When you need it at nighttime, when you're not generating electricity, you pull it out of the grid, and on an annual basis, you're using the same amount of energy that you're creating. That's where I think we need to be for our definition of net zero energy. So, uh, some other terms that you may hear, uh, I like net zero energy, it just kind of flows out pretty easy. You hear people talk about net zero buildings, net z uh, zero net energy, putting the zero first, or zero energy buildings. Uh, also, people talk about zero carbon, uh, the carbon footprint being carbon neutral uh, is a, a great, very similar term. Uh, energy positive, you see that sometimes. Uh, I know Steve Stevens always uh, says that he's got his, his home has built up now to be energy positive, where he's creating more energy uh, than, he, than he uses. And uh, uh, high performance buildings, uh, living building challenge, and passive house are all you know, interrelated uh, and, and great uh, movements that, uh, that are using a lot of the things that we're, we're talking about when we talk about net zero energy. So that brings us to these four steps uh, that we go through and, uh, in, our, in our designs. And that these absolutely, I, I put this in, in uh, uh, all caps, and then I was like, no, that's not good enough. And I made it red, and I was like, yes, we absolutely have to do these things in this order. So we've got to design the house really well to use the sun. We've got to make the house really efficient, the exterior envelope, the walls, the roofs, good insulation, tight. And then we need to look at, okay, how are we going to heat and cool the building and, and use uh, as efficient of a system as we can. And then, and only then, should we talk about electric generation. So building a, uh, a building that doesn't perform very well and then slapping some uh, photovoltaics on it really is, is doing a disservice to everybody. You're not using the PV well. You, put, you need to put the money into good design, good construction, and then, and only then, are we ready for, for photovoltaics. I think that is extremely, extremely important. So, uh, our first step, uh, this is, you know, should be really old hat. I mean, back in 1981, when John's house was built, uh, you know, this, is, this is, was the state of the art. This is what they were working on, uh, that passive design. And we can't forget that. That is, uh, this is, uh, Sustainability 101. We've got to we've got to uh, design the house to use uh, to use the sun, to use breezes, to use uh, passive passive heating, passive cooling, and uh, that is uh, that is where we where we need to start. So here I, I like this diagram. This is this is a house that we designed about 10 years ago. It's off grid, and. Uh, Real typical for us when we start designing, we, do, we start with two schemes. So we do one, one scheme that maybe that's sort of what the owner expects, and then we do another scheme that pushes the boundaries and does something they don't expect, uh, design the house in a totally different way. Well, here we had a, we had a homeowner. Who, they actually have a, a, a kitchen, uh, kitchen uh, subcontracting business. 
And so they do designs a lot for the kitchens, and they thought, well, well, we can design a house. And this was basically their house design. We had to fix it up and make it work. You know, their stairs didn't work and things like that. But but we we took their design and uh, and drew it up the best way we could, but we knew that design was just not going to work very well. But that's what they wanted. So we gave, them, we gave them what they wanted. And then we did a separate design. So North is straight up in this. We, we uh, have to draw the house long in the east-west direction. That's, this is just, I'm sorry if this is repeat for a lot of you, but this is uh, Passive Solar Design 101 here draw that building out long in the east-west direction that maximizes the south face and then uh, you want to minimize the east and west because that east sun when it comes up in the morning is is pretty harsh when it sets in the west in the afternoon it's really harsh overheating houses is very common in the denver area because people have these great west views of the mountain right and and they they want to maximize that so we wind up with these two stories of glass facing west and the blinds are all pulled, so you can't see out the windows at all, right? So minimize those west windows, minimize the east. On the north, do very, very little uh, openings at all. Just have really good insulation and open up that south south face. Fortunately, they had a great south-facing view. This is up in uh, Granby. And uh, so fortunately, uh, I can't tell you how many times when we've done this, the, the, the owner still wants the design that they, they drew up. Fortunately, we had a more discerning uh, client, and they did proceed with, uh, with this design, and this is uh, what they wound up with. So there's that long east-west direction. Uh, it's off-grid, so we had the photovoltaics uh, generating the electricity use in the house and, uh, and a fair, fair amount of south-facing uh, glazing. It's easy to overglaze too, so you do, do have to watch out for that. Uh, but then, here's the beauty of the south-facing sun. And when that sun is uh, in, in the summer, when it's blazing and we don't want it in the house, it's up at a 74 degree uh, uh, angle off of, the, off of the ground. So a very small overhang, you can see a very small overhang will cut out and not allow that sun to enter uh, enter through the window. So just properly sizing the overhang cuts out that summer sun. And then you, you come to winter time and that sun is way down low in the sky at 26 degrees uh, above the earth and, and that overhang is not cutting out the winter sun so it allows that, allows that to flow in. And when we do have a lot of glass on the south side, we do a lot of shading devices. H&H uh, &H Metals here is a local company that builds some really nice uh, metal shading devices. This one is uh, kind of one of our standard details built out of wood, uh, but it, it shades, the, shades the summer sun, allows in the winter sun, but shading those south facing windows is very important. We want the sun in the, sum, in the winter, we don't want it in the summer. Uh, also, I should say that uh, you know, programs, we, everything is drawn now uh, in full three dimensional models. Uh, we use Revit, it's kind of the industry standard. Uh, and that allows us to do shading studies. So we can, we can create these models and we know exactly when the sun is gonna hit the windows and we time that and uh, that, really, that really helps us, helps us tweak that and get, get the design right. So, uh, and last, um, I would say, I dare say this is becoming less important. I used to be a, a huge advocate for thermal mass. This is a, a home uh, where we use the uh, a concrete floor as a slab on grade. This is ground polished concrete. Uh, we have we have a lot of stone in the house to capture that sun's energy, uh, and uh, we're we're putting less emphasis, I would say, these days on thermal mass. It's still definitely something to pay attention to. It's going to make your house more uh, more efficient, and uh, and so uh, that that thermal mass. What happens is the the sun comes in heats up your thermal mass and, and sort of soaks it up. And then uh, that evening as the sun goes down, it's getting cooler. Uh, now that those, the, the thermal mass, whether that's in you know, water tubes we've done, certainly stone and concrete floors, uh, even uh, uh, gypcrete, an inch and a half of gypcrete with tile on top is, makes a nice thermal mass, uh, that radiates off the heat at night. And so it makes your house more comfortable because when that sun does come in, even in the winter, I don't know if you've been up in any houses. I, I was, remember I was standing in one at 10,000 feet that had an overglazed south wall 
and it was middle of winter, still unbelievably hot in that house, and they were asking me, what do we do? Uh, one of the things they could have done is they could have had thermal mass in there to soak up that, that energy so that it would radiate it back out uh, at night. So, so uh, once, we've, once we've designed the house, we've got the correct orientation, we've shaded the south sun, we allow that south sun in the winter, we've got some thermal mass, now we're ready to start thinking about the thermal envelope, we call it. So that's the exterior walls, the roof, uh, the the basement, and we need to we need to do a really really good job of uh, of, of limiting uh, the amount of uh, exterior environment that's going to be transferred inside. Right? We want to we want to keep that cold out in the winter. We want to keep the the uh, hot out in the summer. This is our rule of thumb, and uh, so the 5, 10, 20, 40, 80. You just double it each time. You start with R5 for the windows. So that's uh, a U value of 0.2 is, so it's the inverse. The U value is the inverse of the R value. If you hear people talking about the U value of windows uh, or, and doors, any openings are measured that way. So we like to get that, uh, that to about an R5 or better. Uh, the below slab insulation, an R10, so down in your, in your basement, we use two inches of rigid insulation below the, below the concrete slabs. R20 uh, for the walls below grade. So you've already got you know, that, that, uh, that, that wall, uh, once you get down to four feet or so deep, that, uh, that soil outside is going to uh, stay at you know, 40, 45 degrees even during the winter. So you don't need as much insulation when you're uh, below grade walls. And then the above grade walls, we shoot for an R40. I'll show you a few ways that we do that. And then for the roof, we want R80. If you can't remember the 5, 10, 20, 40, 80, just double whatever code says you're supposed to do. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a good rule of thumb. And I'll tell you, you get contractors. I don't, do we have any contractors in the room? Yeah. Uh, some contractors, not this one, uh, will, uh, will say, what the heck? You know, I've gotten calls saying, hey, can I eliminate that insulation under the slab? We really don't need it. Code doesn't require it. Yeah. Why, are, why are we putting so much insulation in these walls? I can save the homeowner. You know, X number of dollars because of that. I, why, why do you want this much insulation in the roof? Uh, these are our rules of thumb. Uh, we feel like once you start getting above those, maybe, maybe you are spending more money than you really need to, but insulation is cheap. And it is really inexpensive insurance to get, uh, to get the house that is going to perform well for you. And it's gonna make it more comfortable too. It's gonna make it quieter. Uh, and, and you're going to use less energy heating and cooling. So lots and lots of benefits. Uh, so some of the insulation methods we've used, uh, structural insulated panels, insulated concrete forms. I've got a, pictures of a couple of those. Double stud wall construction, that was this. It's hard to take a picture of double stud wall. It just looks like a bunch of studs. But what we do is, uh, is just have two rows of studs with about an inch in between, and that gives you a, a nice eight-inch thick uh, or nine inch thick wall, eight to nine, and fill that. We like the uh, bibs, the uh, blown in blanket, uh, fiberglass insulation. You fill that up and you get, you're easily over R30 and uh, go a little thicker, you can get to R40 or do some exterior rigid insulation. But uh, framing is really pretty inexpensive and you only need a two by four frame for, for a house. Uh, we went to two by six years ago just to, just to increase the amount of insulation. So go back to that two by four for your structural wall on the exterior, put another two by four wall inside of that, get a nice thick wall, fill that with insulation, and it really is very inexpensive. You'll have a little cost savings dropping from two by six to two by four for your structure, and then you'll have a little more cost uh, in, the, in the second uh, framing wall inside. However, Framing is, is really not a big portion of your, of your overall budget. That, and you're only talking your exterior walls. You know, you're not increasing the width of the interior walls. Jim? What about putting a, a sheetrock between those two? Like, like they do on party I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend putting gyp bo gypsum board in the middle of the wall, because then you're going to affect how that wall can dry out to the inside or the outside. That, that's, that you're going to have a potential of trapping some moisture in there, I think. Value in doing the double two by four is to have the equivalent of a two by eight. 
Uh, well, it, with that one inch in between the, the uh, one inch or more in between the, the two sets of studs, you've got a, a full thermal break then. Uh, so uh, exterior rigid insulation is another way to get that continuous insulation, but by, by, uh, by having the double stud, uh, you're also, uh, and then we offset, we offset the studs as well so that the studs on the inside wall don't align with the studs on the outside wall so you get really good continuous insulation throughout the entire That's wall. Wood is a low R yeah, wood doesn't have a lot of R value to it. Um, nope. The double stud wall, there's a little bit of controversy about it as far as condensation on the outside wall. Mm -hmm. Do you have concerns about it? Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts? Uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't found any problems with condensation. Uh, uh, is that because of the, the bibs? Insulation? That passive house doesn't like double stud mm -hmm. walls in okay. this climate. Mm -hmm. Just because as the moisture moves through the wall, it gets cold. And mm -hmm. you, need, you need something to block the air in the middle. Mm -hmm. You want it to dry to the inside and dry to the outside. Mm -hmm. But so it's just it's a concern of theirs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a nice it's it's a nice wall system, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to get some thoughts about mm -hmm. it or any if any failures or signs of failures. Mm -hmm. Do you put a vapor barrier on the inside? <clears throat> Uh, we actually don't like, well, if, if you're going to use a vapor barrier on the inside, we'd certainly recommend the smart vapor barriers, not like, not like the six mil visqueen. Uh, but we, we typically do not do a vapor barrier. We just use the, the code requires something, and we put on our drawings that the paint is the, is the vapor barrier. So. How about the house wrap on the outside? Yes, on the, out, on the outside we would have, that's your, uh, that's your moisture barrier. It's not a not a vapor barrier. The uh, house wrap tie back on the outside was the question. Yep. What's been your experience with the uh, cost factor of the, of the jam extension on doors and windows? Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing uh, if if you're doing a, a wood, say trimming out everything in wood, you're going to have a little more cost in that. Uh, in, in that, but if you're just wrapping it with gypsum board, you know, there's not. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, that that can run a, a little bit, but it's really just one extra one extra piece of trim around. I mean, yes, there are, there is cost associated with that. Let me just uh, go to some of these other. Uh, so continuous exterior rigid insulation, we love to use that. Uh, it you have to be careful about what you're what your siding is going to be. So that's once you put up the once you put up the stud wall and then you put exterior rigid insulation. So this company Zip has developed a sheathing that has the continuous insulation built into it and I'll show you a picture of that. And straw bale is, is always uh, a good uh, a good option. Uh, so this is these are structural insulated panels. I didn't have a good picture of it uh, of them actually putting putting one up but we did an entire school down in Castle Rock uh, using these, and so this is just fi a styrofoam insulation with uh, a sheet of OSB on either side. So that's your in entire uh, wall insulation structure. We just put the interior finish on, put the exterior finish on, put house wrap or building wrap on the outside. Uh, but uh, that makes a, a very tight, well insulated building uh, very quickly. Uh, insulated concrete forms. Put the uh, puts two layers of insulation on the on the outside edges, and then you fill the center with concrete. It's used a lot for foundations. We've built entire houses all the way up to the eave with uh, with ICFs. This is just a picture I grabbed off of Fox Blocks website, but there there are others. And if you don't like polystyrene, which you know, we do you know, like to stay away from, uh, there are a couple of companies uh, that that make uh, that make. ICFs out of uh, uh, wood and uh, concrete, uh, so they're a little heavier block. But Fastwall and uh, Duracell are, are two of those that we've we've used. Why don't you like polystyrene fire? Uh, just yeah, the the environmental uh, aspects of when as it's being as it's being made is oh. you know, it, it and and yeah and and fire certainly is it's not going to perform well in a fire. 
Uh, this is the zip system. So if you've seen buildings going up around town that, ha that are all green and then they've got this black tape on it, so that's, that's zip. Uh, what they do is they take, a, they take insulation and they bond, bond their uh, OSB sheathing to it and then they, uh, and then they have the, this is basically your house wrap which is already bonded to it. So it all comes out. Contractors, some contractors like it. I don't, do, you, do you like it, Bill? Well, so I've used it on one, and, and the, the poly iso foam wasn't always glued on square. Oh, they really? Trim a lot and oh. foam the gaps. Okay, yeah. And also, they don't make a panel that's more than an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. Right, and again, right. Like, yep. uh, passive models will show that that's a dangerous wall. Mm -hmm. You can have condensation, so they want at least two inches, mm -hmm. and zip doesn't do it. But I yeah. think for yeah. I think it's a cool system. Yeah, yeah. So, I need to try to move along a little bit more. This is uh, a, straw a straw bale home up in Genesee that uh, uh, was built last year. This was on last year's uh, solar home tour, actually, if you went on that. And uh, so uh, once you get that, once you've selected your exterior, uh, exterior envelope, as the contractor is building it, we like to see them perform a blower door test. So this is a, a door sealed up with a big fan, and they're, uh, they're doing testing. Mainly, you know, we don't so much care about what the actual numbers show. What we want to see is we want to see uh, the, the, the tester going around the house and uh, with a thermal imaging camera and making sure that any leaks are sealed up. This is a great time during construction before you've got those, uh, the, the final finishes on to go and make sure all of your, all of your uh, joints are, are sealed up. Of course, you got to do it while you're building too, but, but this is a great test. Uh, so if you make sure your contractor does that, it's literally a few hundred dollars. It's not, not very expensive at all. But that, uh, that combined with proper air sealing techniques all around the house as you're building it, will uh, uh, air movement through, through walls is uh, just as critical as the insulation levels itself. So once we've done that, now we're ready to start talking about how we're going to heat and cool the home and the other systems we're going to use. So uh, this, the, heating, the space heating and cooling is going to be your primary uh, energy usage, but also uh, hot water, how you, how you heat your water is going to be very important. Cooking, clothes dryer, these are all things that we typically in Colorado would use natural gas to do. We use natural gas to heat, we use natural gas to, uh, to create the hot water uh, for you know, people love a gas stove, right? Uh, and your clothes dryer, uh, you know, for years and years, we've always said natural gas is the, the most effect, effect, uh, efficient clothes dryer that you're going to have. So, uh, so for heating and cooling, and this is something that we've been working on, uh, trying to get a, away from this, I would say this is a, a little bit of a crutch. And almost all of our net zero energy homes to this point have used a ground source heat pump. Uh, system for heating and cooling. The problem is they're they're fairly expensive, and we're we're looking at other ways uh, we can heat and cool without having to go to the expense of a of a geothermal system. However, Todd back there will will tell you that uh, as long as we do a really good job insulating then a, and sealing the house and designing it for uh, for passive solar, that ground source heat pump system doesn't need to be that big, and so you do drop that cost. Uh, the ground source heat pump is also uh, uh, eligible, still eligible for a 30% tax rebate from the, uh, from the federal government. So that is going away uh, in 2023, I believe. Uh, so, uh, so get it while it lasts. Through the end of next year, it's 30%, then it drops to 26, 22, and, and then goes away. So. Uh, not going to spend a lot of time talking about these systems themselves. The mini split, uh, I don't know if you've seen, this is, this is kind of the typical what people think of when you think of a mini split system. And uh, it's this little box. They're coming down in price. Uh, they're pretty efficient. Uh, so so the, the, the mini splits are great for small spaces. Uh, maybe, maybe can be used for an entire house. You can, you can use them uh, like this. You can duct them so that this, instead of having this, which a lot of people would not want to see in their house, especially in their living room, uh, we can hide those systems. So I think this right here is actually, that's the mini split unit, and then, and then run duct work off of it. So we can, we can use those. So that's an air source heat pump uh, rather than a ground source heat pump is basically what the, the mini split is. 
has a coefficient of performance of around three, which means for every one unit of electricity that you're putting into it, you're getting three units of heating or cooling out of it. So uh, it's a fairly e efficient uh, system. Uh, then the heating, uh, the water heating, uh, we have been using more and more of these. Uh, Steigl Eltron is a great, great brand of, uh, it's a heat pump water heater. Sometimes our mechanical engineers don't like them a lot because what it's doing is it's, it's uh, dumping uh, cold into the, into the space that it's in. But if you're careful about where you put it and if it's sitting in a, in a space that you have other things that are kind of generating electricity, it can be a pretty nice, uh, nice arrangement. So the thing about these, they're uh, uh, an air source heat pump also, just like the mini split, and uh, just uh, putting that, that energy into creating hot water rather than heating or cooling air. Uh, they run around $2,500, so they're not that inexpensive, but you know, then uh, it's, it's a much simpler system. You don't have any, you don't have the venting for, uh, uh, that you would for, for natural gas or propane. And uh, literally, you plumb it in and plug it in, and it's it's ready to go. So. Oh, okay, great. I didn't know that. So, twenty. Are they down that low now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Careful of the brand. Make sure check check it out. Steibel Eltron is one kind of pioneered that great great product, but there are others uh, out there. So. On all of our sustainable homes, we used to push our clients to install a solar, uh, solar thermal system, so solar hot water. Uh, rule of thumb, not, not very long ago, was two flat plate solar collectors would, uh, would generate 75% of the hot water needed in a home. Costs about $7,500 to install, and it's a good system. We called that the, the workhorse of uh, of solar, uh, active solar energy. And uh, uh, the problem is that you're spending $7,500 for that system, and then you have to have your backup hot water for when, when it's not hot or you've depleted the, 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 the uh, hot water from your solar system. So you're still installing another, uh, another source of, of water heating. With this, uh, you are, uh, you're only spending $2,500 or less, and, uh, and, and then you put a couple more solar panels on your roof to generate the electricity to operate that. Now you've got, uh, now you've got a fully sustainable you know, electric system uh, for a lot less that's creating 100% of your, your hot water needs. So we really, uh, really like this. Yeah. Uh, so cooking, I'm not going to spend long on this, but the uh, uh, the induction uh, cooktops are, uh, they basically work, they, they, they provide everything that, uh, that most people love about gas. They're instant on, instant off, and they're all electric. So we, we introduce our, our clients to the, to the wonders of induction uh, cooking. And for uh, clothes drying, there are heat pump, uh, uh, heat pump clothes dryers out there now. Uh, Basically, you know, using the same sort of technology as many splits and the, the uh, heat pump water heaters. So. so now when we've done all of that, now we're finally ready to start talking about generating electricity on site. And almost 100% of the time, our conversations are going to be around photovoltaics. We have looked at small, small scale wind. It, it's still a tough sell. Maybe if you're, if you're out, uh, out somewhere. Uh, and, and really do have good, reliable wind. But, uh, but this is, you know, this is our, our mantra, is that we need, to do, uh, we need to do everything for those first three steps before, uh, before we start talking about photovoltaics. So we don't, we don't want to just slap lipstick on a pig or however you want to call it. Uh, uh, we, want, uh, we want to make sure that we've got that house really well designed in all other aspects before we uh, before we incorporate photovoltaics. So uh, just a little bit, little bit of information uh, about photovoltaics. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this. Your photovoltaic panels, typically on the roof. You know, we're, a lot of times we're putting uh, photovoltaics ground mounted, though, on a, on a very simple racking system. If you've got a little bit of land and there's a spot to do that, uh, especially up in the mountains, uh, 
ground mounting is nice because uh, you can you can get the snow off them. You can clean them very easily. You're not trying to climb up on the roof. And and uh, yeah, if you want to see some nice ground mounted ones, check out Jim's office down on South Golden Road. You're just laying, uh, sitting right there. You can walk up to him and look at look at how he's mounted those. Uh, but you've got the photovoltaic panels, and then you've got uh, this is the inverter. And uh, so all those panels are running to, in this case, a single uh, string inverter. And then you've got your, uh, your service panel. So these are, those are your, uh, you know, just your typical um, circuit breaker panel. And then you've got the smart meter. And the smart meter is key. This isn't, uh, we're lucky in Colorado that uh, I, I think every utility in Colorado uh, offers smart metering. That's not, still not the case all the way across the United States. So the smart meter allows uh, allows the electricity to flow, flow backwards and and reduce your uh, you know, just kind of remove <laughs> remove from your uh, from your record any energy that you've used any electricity that you've used and then when you're using when you're using the uh, uh, energy from the grid it flows you know the direction we'd normally expect a, a meter to so those are the those are the four parts that you need uh, in order to make that happen there are some options with inverters. Uh, not going to go into that today, but uh, certainly your your solar installing company uh, will be able to uh, recommend the, the proper inverters, string inverters or micro inverters. Uh, don't see DP, DC power optimizers very much on on residences, but uh, and so here's just a few quick facts about photovoltaics and why it is such uh, a great option. Now, if you go back to 2009. Okay, and this is the uh, the the number of, of installations that were being done in 2009, and this is uh, the cost of 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 the, of, uh, of the photovoltaic installation. So more than seven dollars per watt. So we weren't we didn't have uh, that many of them, and then through 2010, 11, 12, 13, you know, look in 2014, we're down to just over three dollars per watt. Install. Uh, sorry, we're at two two twenty per watt. I believe this is uh, these prices are commercial, not residential. But uh, as that as that price dropped, we saw more and more installations uh, come about, and and uh, now you know down under two dollars per watt. We use we use right now about two dollars per watt as a rule of thumb for what the what the PV installation is going to cost you. But this is why. This and this, of course, have a direct relationship, and, and that is why it makes sense to uh, install photovoltaics now. Here's uh, this would be installed cost, yeah. Installed solar PV capacity, uh, solar PV prices. Uh, another way of looking at it, so this is the green are the residential installations, the orange are non-residential commercial, and then the the blue are utility grade installations, but you can see uh, how they how they have grown to now and how they are continuing to uh, estimate that photovoltaics are going to get more and more popular. It's not leveling out; it's still it's still taking off. Uh, here is the this is uh, information taken from the SunShot Initiative from the Department of Energy. So uh, this is where we are. Uh, right now, so here's the residential. You can kind of ignore that commercial and utility uh, for this talk. But back in 2010, uh, this is a uh, uh, the LC. Yeah. So the 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 cost of uh, of installing uh, photovoltaics back in 2010 versus where we're at, and this was 2016, which was the late, latest year available at this time. And then their goal is to bring, bring those costs down half again in, uh, by 2020 and half again by, two, by 2030. So if we, if we can reduce the cost of photovoltaic installations by you know, another 50% or more, then we're really going to be, it's going to be, yeah, just like everyone's going to be driving electric cars, everyone's going to have photovoltaic panels uh, either on their roof or if you've got a home like mine that's in a uh, very uh, heavily treed area. I'm looking forward to the city of Golden building their solar gardens so that we can uh, put the money that we would have put into photovoltaics on our house where they don't work 
into the solar gardens uh, where they will work. So, so that's just knowing, know that the uh, Department of Energy and other really good people like NREL are, are uh, working to bring those costs down even further. We're not done yet. It doesn't mean wait, it just means that you know, as, as we go on further that you will see those costs drop. And this is another slide that I really, I think this is just fantastic. I think very few people uh, know and understand this. So uh, this is how much energy is generated from a photovol photovoltaic installation. This happens to be in LA is where they did this test. But uh, this is using, I think you can ignore this top bar because that's a dual tracking system, you know, like you see up on South Table Mountain at, at uh, NREL's facility. So we're, probably, we're not going to do that on a house. So let's just look at if you, have, uh, if, if you just have a fixed panel and it's facing south, you're going to generate 1566, that's uh, kilowatt hours of annual production out of uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one watt of, of panel, but in any event, the units aren't really important. It's that that an, kind of an optimized south-facing uh, panel tilting is going to generate 1566 units of energy, right? Then you look at west and east. For Colorado, you should flip these, but you can see if you you tilt that panel, this would actually in Colorado be due east. This would be due west. Uh, but uh, if you tilt that panel due east instead of due south, you're only losing about 10% of the energy, 10%. So put in one more panel up on there, and you know, if you can't get the panels facing south, it's okay. You know, actually, we like a little eastern tilt to our panels because we get that nice early morning sun, and the afternoon it gets cloudy. You've got the mountains to the west blocking that last little bit of sun, so facing a little bit of east is okay. But facing due east is just fine. Don't face them north like they did on the, up on uh, Highway 93 there. Just one more second. But then here is, here's the beauty. Look at this. No tracking installed flat. Just a, on a flat roof, just put them flat. We like to have a little bit of tilt so you know, snow and rain come off them and they keep a little cleaner. But there, you're at the same. You're, you're a 10% penalty for just putting them flat. So people get all up in arms about, oh, it's got to face south. It's got to face south. It doesn't. And you're still going to get a lot of energy production out of that. So now, question? Oh, I think you didn't mention that. The housing unit on uh, development on 93, yeah. if you go north, like, or the north side. I, there are some I don't, don't understand. But yeah, I'm sure it's generating a little yeah. in the summer when the sun's high. But yeah. All right. So uh, that's kind of the end of you know, uh, what we do, why we do it. Uh, just a few quick images. These are uh, two homes that are on the, the uh, tour. I keep calling it the solar home tour. What is it called, John? Green home tour. The green home tour. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, in Morrison and uh, a great, uh, uh, really fun, fun house. Uh, but this is net zero energy. I'm not crazy about how they installed the solar panels. You're not supposed to see them. We designed them to lay flatter down on the roof. That's how they got installed. They didn't ask me. Uh, and they didn't follow our drawings. But it works well for the solar tour this weekend, or the, the green tour this weekend, so you can actually see the panels. Uh, but uh, really, really wonderful house. Uh, really bright inside. Now, this is an example of a, it, their view is facing north. So uh, we're, we have these south-facing clear story windows bringing in that south sun. Uh, so, you know, it happens. We have clients who buy north-facing lots, and there's, you know, uh, we can't, can't always control that. Uh, this house, another net zero energy house, this has a 10 kW uh, array. Uh, don't tell Excel Energy, but uh, Excel has their little calculation of how many panels you're allowed to put on the house. And we had designed a 30, 30 panel system, so 10 kW. And uh, uh, Excel came through and said, nope, you can only put 28 panels. Well, they had already bought all 30 of them. They had already installed them. And so we did some quick calculations because it's based on square footage. And we showed that, well, that crawl space has a really tall headroom. So maybe we can call that part of the house. They were already using it for storage and things. So, uh, and uh, so we got them up to where they could have 29 panels. So they only had to remove one panel. Um, and I don't What's think that? it ever got removed. What's that limit set for? Net metering or something? Or is that 
Yeah, Excel doesn't want you to generate more energy than you need. They don't want to, they, they don't want, uh, they want to generate the, the power. They don't want a lot of competition, so. so. I honestly don't know what Excel does for if you generate more power than you use, other than you know annualize, you know, kind of. But they, buy they, 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 okay, yeah. So they they buy it back, but at a much lower rate if you actually do create more than you need, Jim. If you show them a purchase agreement for a Tesla, for example, um, they will go beyond allow. What your last mm -hmm. twelve months was because mm -hmm. of your future yep. twelve months. Yeah. Yeah. And the same is now true for heat pumps. So if we're doing retrofits on homes, we have gas and electric usage. But if we're going by Excel's rules for installing solar, it's only for the electric side. We're not for heating or cooling, for heating. But if we're going to a heat pump for cooling, they have, They'll allow as long more. as you have an engineer say, this, mm -hmm. uh, this, this heat pump is going to make there no gas use anymore. And that equals 4,000 kilowatts. So this was an existing house, so we, we were a little limited on what we could do, uh, but we did uh, use an exterior uh, rigid insulation for continuous insulation there. Uh, this is that straw bale house. I showed this image before. This was on the tour last year. So the back wall is straw bale. We also used Duracell uh, ICFs on that. Uh, and uh, this is their, uh, I think it was just under a 10 kW installation. and. Uh, is the, the interior, that nice house up in Genesee. And so they're, they're very nice homes. People, they spent a lot of money on these homes, but they're uh, you know, not, not outrageous amounts. And certainly the little bit of extra they put into the, uh, uh, into the systems to get to net zero energy uh, are pale in comparison to some of the things they spent you know, on an $8,000 stove and you know, things like that. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, this was on the home tour uh, three years ago. Uh, this is actually a duplex. So this is the this is a single family home, three car garage with a, a large accessory dwelling unit that she rents out. Uh, I think this is about a nine kW system. It's got a ground source heat pump, and she claims that it's uh, it's it's showing net zero each year. So. Uh, this house, uh, this was our first house that we did double stud uh, construction on and uh, worked out very well. They were not a fans of photovoltaic. We did design this roof to have photovoltaics on it and if they put the photovoltaics on it would be net zero energy. So we'd call this net zero and energy ready. That started as a rectangle <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and uh, this one was on the home tour, was that last year or two years ago I think? Uh, when it was still under construction. Uh, this is, we call this like our, our almost net zero energy. Uh, this does happen. Uh, the, the contractor got involved and said, hey, uh, you're spending a lot of money on that uh, ground source heat pump. We can save you a lot of money by just going to a really efficient uh, gas fired uh, heating system with a good you know, high sear rating on the, the air conditioner. Uh, and by the way, we'll install two of them. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, they dropped to a 4KW system. So it's one of these, it's a net zero uh, uh, electricity building, uh, but it uses gas for the, for the heating. So I was kind of bummed about that, but it's a beautiful house and uh, double stud wall construction, uh, sips for the roof, uh, well, well insulated and uh, is performing, performing very well. Uh, and then it, just two, two last slides. I think these are uh, kind of interesting to compare. This is a, a school in Castle Rock that we did a couple of years ago, or opened a year ago. And all of these roofs are designed to have photovoltaics on them in the future. This one, because it was gonna be shaded south is that way. Uh, because this was gonna be shaded, we didn't care about how many pen roof penetrations and they kind of went wild. You can see we just have one penetration there, one there for bathrooms. And uh, so these are all set up for future, future photovoltaics. If they could have spent $500,000 on the photovoltaics, they could have a very near 
net zero energy school. And that sounds like a lot of money, but it's a $9 million school. So you're talking about five, six percent. If they could have increased their budget by six percent, they could have they could have put the photovoltaics on there. Being a school, they don't pay taxes, so they don't get the tax benefits. Makes it a little more difficult. Uh, I know this is a residential discussion, but they also in Colorado we have uh, uh, demand metering, which usually accounts for about half of your bill. And photovoltaics really aren't going to cut, cut that down. So. It's a tough sell sometimes between the the uh, uh, between the not having the tax breaks and still having to pay half of your utility bill because of the demand metering makes it a, a really long long payback. So. Uh, I don't know at what point demand metering starts. Uh, yeah, we, I, I mean, our, our office is small also, and uh, we don't have demand charges on our bill. I think you have to hit a certain threshold. Anyone in the room know about any, any more information about demand metering? It's really not part of this discussion, so, yeah. Yeah, do a, a, a PPA, power purchase agreement, or, or a lease. Yep. Yeah, there are, there are ways around that, but it still doesn't help with the demand, demand charges. But, yep. Is this a year-round school? Or this is a, uh, well, no. Uh, they yeah. take a couple months so off in the summer. summer. Yep. Yep. TV yeah. 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 And um, so this is a 40,000 square foot school and we need to cover all of those roofs in order to get to net zero energy. By the way, this is a variable refrigerant flow. Someone, was, <laughs> someone had brought that up. Uh, it's kind of like a, a mini split for, for commercial applications. Uh, but it is electric heating and cooling. And this is a school that I designed on a mission trip in uh, Liberia, Africa, nearly at the equator and uh, very, very little electric needs uh, no, of course, no heating, no cooling either, other than ceiling fans running. And this is more, our, our electrical engineer told us that's more than enough uh, photovoltaics if they can get them uh, to run the entire school and make that school a net zero energy. So, uh, and this is an 80,000 square foot school. So I, I just think it's interesting. You know, keep our environment with the, the amount of heat that we need, it takes, it takes a lot of energy. And so, you know, driving those energy needs down and then uh, before we, the, we do the photovoltaics is great, but you know, we're always going to need, uh, in our environment, we're going to need more than you do in California or in Liberia to get to net zero energy. But we can do it. The technology is here. It should just be a no-brainer. And uh, so that's, that's why we, we do what we do. I think that's, yeah, that was the end of that. So, thank you.